All right, everyone, good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alpana Wagmari. I'm a pediatric infectious disease uh, physician scientist at the UW Department of Peds and Fred Hutchinson Canner Cancer Center. And I'll be guest moderating today's session for the vaccines, uh, viruses and vaccine seminar series. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Neil King, who is from the UW Department of Biochemistry and the Institute for Protein Design. And uh, Dr. King has worked with many of the individuals, I believe, on this call, probably. Um, but um, a, a brief intro is he, his group is focused on developing protein-based um, technologies for multiple different medical applications, including the biologics delivery, as well as structure-based vaccine design, which is what I'm hoping he'll talk to us about today. Um, his platform, um, uh, using nanoparticle uh, um, computational nanoparticle vaccine design has pushed forward a number of different candidate vaccines for really a number of different pathogens, including, of course, SARS-CoV-2, but also RSV, metanumavirus, and flu, which I'm hoping we'll touch on a little bit today as well. Um, and yeah, we're excited to, to hear, hear your talk. Um, as usual, we'll um, uh, keep the questions to the chat and we'll get to those at the end. And um, but at the end, we're also welcome to you know, turn off your turn off your um, excuse me, turn on your video and, and um, mention any questions directly to Neil. I would also like just to put in a brief plug for um, the next session, which is on March 21st uh, with Kai Yuan, Kai Yuan Soon from um, the NIH Fogarty International Center. So same time on Tuesday, March 21st. And with that, I'll stop sharing and let you begin. Great, thanks Alpana. Um, and thanks for the invitation to be here. I'm excited to talk to you all today. And yeah, I would, I would love to have a robust discussion at the end. So please, please throw those questions into the chat or just keep them in mind and let's talk at the end. And Alpana, can you just nod your head if the slides are showing up okay? Great, all right. All right, so let's let's talk today about technology development for structure-based vaccine design. And just for some disclosures, so we uh, founded a company based on some of the technology that I'll be talking about today, and I have ongoing relationships with them. And then our lab has also received sponsored research agreements in GSK and Pfizer, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so to start out, I, I, I mean, I almost don't even need to say it, but we're all of us living in the midst of a technology-driven revolution in vaccine design. Um, I'm showing just two examples on this slide. One is antigen engineering um, for improved conformational or physical stabilization. The poster child for this at this point is prefusion RSVF, which was developed in the, the mid-2010s at the NIH, early 2010s, um, and is now the basis of vaccines by Pfizer, GSK, and others um, that have looked absolutely spectacular in phase three clinical trials and are going to be approved this year, I would guess. Um, these will be the first licensed vaccines for RSV. Um, and I often say that, you know, RSV is the virus that nobody's ever heard of until they become a parent. Because when your kid gets this and they're very young, it can be quite severe. Two of my three daughters spent time in the hospital with RSV. So I think all of the parents on planet Earth are going to welcome these vaccines based on this particular technology. And then another one that, that, of course, we've all been become quite familiar with over the last couple of years is mRNA vaccines, which are a novel vaccine delivery technology um, that have now been into to billions of people on this planet. So those aren't the other two, or, or the only two technologies. As I mentioned, there are many others. Um, one that I'll be talking about at the beginning of the talk today is self-assembling proteins um, as a platform for making protein nanoparticle vaccines. Um, so here I'm showing really beautiful work from the, from the NIH back in 2013, um, where they used ferritin, a non-viral structural protein that self-assembles to form this octahedral complex of 24 subunits, to scaffold what I will refer to as a complex antigen. This is influenza hemagglutinin. It's a trimeric viral glycoprotein. So it's glycosylated. It's got disulfide bonds. It has to go through the eukaryotic secretory pathway. Um, and this is the sort of antigen that, that you could not put on, for example, a bacteriophage viral, virus like particle, which is a technology that many people were using in the 90s and, and 2000s um, to scaffold short linear epitopes. Here, um, Saru and, and his colleagues showed that 
ferritin was totally capable of scaffolding this complex viral glycoprotein by simple genetic fusion. So you fuse the gene encoding hemagglutinin to the gene encoding ferritin. And then when you, when you transfect this into eukaryotic cells, the cells just spit out these little nanoparticles that are very homogeneous and regular. So every particle looks just like every other one, which is a property of proteins that fold, and in this case, assemble to a single native state. And when used in immunization studies in mice, these particles elicited much more robust humoral immune responses than the commercial seasonal influenza vaccines at the time. And this increase in potency is one of the main advantages of using nanoparticle vaccines, although as I'll hopefully convince you, there are others. So I'm very biased. I love proteins. I think proteins are amazing. Um, and so although there are other types of nanoparticles, I will argue that self-assembling proteins are a particularly promising platform. And that's because, again, they form highly ordered monodispersed structures when you get things right. Um, they're trafficked like pathogens in vivo. So you take advantage of existing physiology in the lymphatic system to traffic these right to lymph nodes and B cell follicles. You can seamlessly integrate your antigen via genetic fusion as Masaru did here. You can scalably manufacture these. So these are just recombinant protein biologics. The worldwide capacity for making these is absolutely massive thanks to the monoclonal antibody industry. They're naturally non-toxic. I mean, they're just proteins. There's no like gold nanoparticle or anything in here. And then the two points that I'll highlight most during today, today's discussion are that <clears throat> using proteins enables atomic level engineering of not only the antigen, like in prefusion RSVF, but also the nanoparticle scaffold. And then finally, because these things are just proteins and you can encode them in a gene, this it allows you to deliver these types of nanoparticle vaccines genetically, as we'll discuss in a few minutes. So one of the things that we're doing here at the Institute for Protein Design is trying to develop kind of more robust protein-based technologies. And the example that we use is if you only limit yourself if you you know if you're at home and you want to invent some new technology like an alarm clock and you limit yourself to only using items that you have around your house right or pre-existing proteins by analogy you come up with some contraption that's ridiculous and and non-controllable right but this isn't how human beings invent technologies we invent new technologies by specking out the pieces that we want and then going and building those pieces in kind of an integrated manner and when you do that you end up with technologies that are simple robust and controllable right? So Apple watches. And this is, this is what we and many others are trying to do through computational protein design. So for nanoparticle vaccines, this is an example of, of one way that we've done this historically. This is a graphical depiction of one of our computational design protocols that we implemented in the Rosetta software. So the, the protocol comprises two fundamental steps. There's a docking step where we pick a target symmetry. This happens to be icosahedral point group symmetry. And then we either go find or increasingly construct de, de novo oligomeric building blocks that share an element of symmetry with the target architecture. We dock those building blocks in the target architecture and find out how they fit together nicely. And then we zoom in on the new interface formed in this case between the, the purple and the gray protein. And we use Rosetta's sequence design capabilities to make up a new amino acid sequence at this interface which if we get it right, should specifically drive assembly of this target structure. So at the end of the day, what you get out of the computer is a hypothesis in two parts, a pair of amino acid sequences and a three-dimensional structure. Those sequences are predicted to form. And so on this slide, I'm some, showing some beautiful work by Jacob Bale, a graduate student in, the, in David Baker's lab that I worked with quite closely a few years ago. And, and Jacob designed uh, these and other self-assembling proteins using this protocol. The ones I've shown on this slide are 120 subunit assemblies with icosahedral symmetry. There are a few megadaltons in scale. So these things are, are, are the size of the smallest viruses. They're about the size of an AAV. And Jacob designed these with atomic level accuracy. So you can see in the, in the negatively stained micrographs on the left that each particle looks different from the other when you compare across particles, but within a micrograph, every particle looks just like every other. So they're very homogeneous and monodisperse. And when we compare averages of those negatively stained particles to projections calculated from our computational design models, we find that they match quite closely. 
when we go and crystallize these things so that we can compare on an atom by atom basis what we made up in the computer compared to what exists in reality, we find that the de deviation is quite small. In both of these cases, it was 0.6 angstroms RMSD. So Jacob put every atom exactly where he said he would to an accuracy of about half the width of an oxygen atom. And the implication, of course, is if you can do that, then you can start designing self-assembling proteins whose structures are tailored to specific applications. So my group has spent the last few years developing these types of nanoparticles as a vaccine platform. And so, of course, when the pandemic broke out three years ago now, um, we wanted to see if our platform could be useful in, in helping fight this virus. And so Brooke Fiala and my group and Lexi Walls and David Wiesler's group here in the biochemistry department teamed up to make this RBD nanoparticle. So we initially made nanoparticles displaying either the spike, the prefusion stabilized spike trimer, or just the RBD. We found that the RBD worked better. And so that's what we moved forward. And so you can see, again, what we're doing is just genetically fusing the RBD to one of our two nanoparticle components. We express that as a standard recombinant biologic. And then we make the other component in whatever expression host is most convenient. We often use E. coli for this one um, because it's cheap, easy, and robust. You just make these two recombinant proteins, you mix them together, and you get these very monodispersed particles that display 60 copies of the, the SARS-CoV-2 RBD at high density. So when we use these particles in immunization studies in mice, we found that they elicited very high levels of neutralizing antibodies, orders of magnitude higher than a panel of human convalescent serum um, that we got from Helen Chu and her colleagues, um, and also at least an order of magnitude higher than the S2P spike trimer. And so on the, on the strength of these results, we, we shipped our mice across the country to Ralph Barrick's lab at the University of North Carolina where Alex Schaefer challenged the mice with their mouse-adapted SARS-CoV-2 strain, and we found that the particles completely prevented replication of the virus in the lungs and nose, whereas you got breakthrough at low dose with the S2P uh, spike and the monomeric RBD on its own, the same antigen that's displayed on the nanoparticle, but in soluble form, provided no protection at all. And so I'm skipping a lot of work in between that result and this one, um, but recently, our collaborators at SK Bioscience, who, who clinically developed this vaccine, put up a preprint with their phase three clinical trial data, um, where they compared the RBD nanoparticle to AstraZeneca's vaccine and showed that in this plot, um, there's about threefold higher levels of neutralizing activity elicited by the RBD nanoparticle compared to Vaxevria. And so last summer, <clears throat> this nanoparticle vaccine um, was fully approved for human use in South Korea and became the world's first computationally designed protein medicine, um, which is a very exciting moment for us. We, we think, we hope that there are many more on the way, um, but this was the beginning. Um, but I'll note here that it took 900 days to approve this vaccine, which historically is, is, is blindingly fast, um, but was you know not even close to, to how fast it was to approve the mRNA vaccines. And this is a point that I'm gonna come back to later. So that's kind of an introduction to the, the nanoparticle platform that we've developed. And when we think about technology development for vaccines, right? So we developed that two component nanoparticle technology, which is now clinically de-risked and we've shown that it can be useful. What other types of technology development can we do in the vaccine space? And I've put on here just a few types of information that vaccines can provide to the immune system and, and specifically nanoparticle vaccines, right? So you can frame a vaccine as, as simply providing information to the immune system to elicit a protective response, right? And so all of these features contain information that you're providing and all of these can in principle be modulated. And so that is the sort of technology development that we're trying to do these days. We're trying to do the technology development that will allow us to generate systematic series of immunogens that vary each of these features quite precisely. And then we'll be able to use those systematic series to go determine what the ideal vaccine looks like, right? What are the structural and functional determinants of immunity? And so I'm going to show you just a couple examples of, of, of that, some preliminary work that we've done in this space, and then talk about how we can encode these things and deliver them genetically. So the first example I'll give is, is a very simple one, 
Um, so this is work we did on our RSV vaccine a few years ago, where Brooke basically titrated the valency of the antigen on this nanoparticle. So this particular nanoparticle can, at maximum, scaffold 20 copies of prefusion RSVF, this blue antigen. But because of the two-component nature of this particle, it's constructed from an orange protein and a gray protein. Again, you, you pipette these things together to drive assembly, right? You control assembly of the particle. And that allowed Brooke to dope in unmodified gray trimer that didn't have the antigen attached. And so when she did that, she, she showed that she could make particles with 100% valency. So that's 20 blue trimers, two thirds valency, one third valency. And you can actually see that titration on the gel right here. And all of these particles looked identical. They looked just like uh, what we expected. And then when we went and immunized mice with these particles, we saw that increasing valency led to increased potency of the antibody response, right? So by generating this small and simple systematic series of immunogens, we were able to learn that higher density display leads to better antibody responses. A more recent example um, is using these sorts of approaches to vary the type and composition of glycans on our nanoparticle vaccines. So there's beautiful work that's been coming out of Daryl Irvine's lab at MIT the last couple of years, showing that glycans on nanoparticle immunogens can modulate antigen trafficking in vivo. So how quickly does the antigen make it to germinal center, or I'm sorry, lymph nodes? And then where does the antigen go within the lymph node? Is it retained in the, the sinus and the medulla, or does it actually make it into B cell follicles? and initiate germinal center formation. And so we teamed up with Daryl to, to try to use our two component nanoparticles to better understand this effect. And so Jake Kraft, a, a really talented postdoc in the lab, again, used in vitro assembly of these particles to make a series of immunogens where he modulated glycan valency or density and also glycan type because the, the work coming from, from the Irvine lab had suggested that it's really high mannose glycans that are driving this effect. So Jake made two series of nanoparticles where he titrated glycan density. One half of that was using complex glycans, so just kind of the normal glycans that would come out of eukaryotic cells. And then in a second series, he made the same valency titration but added kyphonensine to his tissue culture medium so that all of the glycans would come out high manos. And we sent the, these series of particles to the Irvine lab and they did this beautiful imaging work in lymph nodes, looking for co-localization of the vaccine in red with CD35, a marker of B cell follicles in blue. And, and when you quantitate these data, what we saw was that you had to have high manos glycans to get this, this concentration effect in B cell follicles. Complex glycans just didn't work at all. And then when you had high mannose glycans, it was very density dependent. So the more high mannose glycans you had on there, the better localization you got, and that titrated down. So this is another example of how you can generate these systematic series of immunogens and then ask questions in a functioning immune system and learn what the ideal parameters or features of a vaccine might be. Okay, so um, when you think about these things and, and, and think about them in terms of information content, one question that comes up is, okay, how much of this information can we encode genetically? Because as we saw during the pandemic, genetic delivery of vaccines really dramatically simplifies and accelerates manufacturing. So this is the timeline from the early uh, development of mRNA-1273 from Moderna they collaborated with the VRC, with Kuzmikia Korbit and Barney Graham and Bob Cedar on the early development. And here, I, I'm just showing this timeline to, to show that the, you know, the genome sequence of the virus became available on January 13th, and Moderna shipped clinical drug product on February 24th, like six weeks later. That is insane, right? That's super fast, and that's because making an mRNA is way, way easier than making a protein in a factory. Every protein is a unique and beautiful snowflake, and you have to develop a different process for each one, but the process for any mRNA sequence is exactly the same. So that's very attractive, but you know what kind of information can be encoded in an mRNA? And I think with protein-based 
uh, nanoparticle vaccines, there's a lot, right? Um, ideally, all of, all of the, the valency titration and the glycans and the, the engineered antigens and everything can be encoded in an mRNA. And so that um, spurred us to ask the question, can we marry the power and the versatility of nanoparticle immunogens with the manufacturing speed of mRNA vaccines? So instead of making an mRNA that encodes you know, a transmembrane protein, membrane-anchored spike, can you deliver an mRNA that encodes a nanoparticle that's secreted from the expressor cell and then traffics to the lymph node um, as a, a more traditional vaccine might? And so <clears throat> we actually had started working on this well before the pandemic, way back in 2017, um, but it, it wasn't working. We couldn't get it to work. Every time we transfected our nanoparticle vaccine constructs for secretion out of, out of eukaryotic cells, we just didn't get any protein out. And it took us a long time to figure out why, but eventually John, a, a graduate student in the lab, figured out what was going on. When we design these nanoparticles, and again, historically using Rosetta, uh, we introduce a lot of hydrophobic amino acids on the surface of the building blocks to drive assembly of the particles. And this results in very long stretches of hydrophobic amino acids, unbroken stretches of hydrophobic amino acids in these proteins. And when they enter the secretory pathway through the SEC61 translocon, uh, the translocon looks at these long stretches of, of hydrophobic amino acids and says, I know what that is. That's a transmembrane domain. And so, in so instead of secreting your protein, it shunts it into the ER membrane and your protein never comes out of cells. And so John took this as a technology development challenge and wrote a computational protocol that he calls the degreaser to identify these, these long hydrophobic segments and then design them out using structure-based design through the introduction of polar amino acids that disrupt that cryptic transmembrane domain, but don't deleteriously affect the stability of the protein overall. And so then you end up with these degreased proteins that lack cryptic transmembrane domains and hopefully will secrete very well. And that's exactly what we observed. So John started by retroactively decreasing this, this nanoparticle called I301, which has just 20 trimers that form a, a homomeric icosahedral complex. And I301 secretes very, very poorly from eukaryotic cells. But when John included a, a few decreasing mutations, he was able to, to increase the, the secreted yield of this protein. Uh, I think it was like 60 or 70 fold. And on a Western blot, this is what that looks like. So cell supernatants from, from cells expressing I301 have almost no protein in them, whereas this, this improved variant, there's a lot of protein there. Um, that newly secreted protein looks just like the I301 that we all know and love. So it hasn't changed the three-dimensional structure or the monodispersity of that particle at all. That was retroactive. Um, John worked with a, a postdoc, Aliona, in the group, to incorporate the degreaser in line during design so that we could prospectively design new highly secretable nanoparticles. And Aliona saw, saw the same thing that John did. When she used the degreaser in line, she found that those nanoparticles were the most highly secreted out of all of her designs. And again, you see these, these dramatic improvements compared to, to nanoparticles that don't have these degreasing mutations. The particles that Aliona gets out, again, are very regular and monodisperse. And so the secretion levels that we observed from these things seem to be high enough that we could actually try launching these nanoparticle vaccines from an mRNA. So many of our designs, the pink and orange dots here, secreted at levels that were comparable to ferritin, that very first nanoparticle I showed from Masaru in the VRC, um, as well as lumazine synthase, another commonly used naturally occurring nanoparticle platform. And so we attached a stabilized version of the SARS-CoV-2 RBD to, the, to one of these nanoparticles, one of these I301 particles, and indeed got uh, robust expression and secretion of that antigen-bearing nanoparticle by just transfecting plasmid into cells and tissue culture. So Grace Hendricks, a new student in the lab, picked this up, picked this project up, and set up an immunogenicity study to compare mRNA-launched nanoparticle vaccines to membrane anchored trimer. Um, this is actually using Pfizer BioNTech sequence. It's the exact same sequence. 
Um, and we wanted to see how does, how does a particle compare? And then we also delivered as a control arm, we delivered a number of the same immunogens in the form of purified protein with adjuvant as we've traditionally done. And so, you know, Grace, of course, uh, made and, and did quality control on all of these mRNA launch particles to make sure that we got what we think we should get. And then we, when we immunized mice with these, we saw um, a few things um, that we think are important. So here I'm showing post-prime data. So this is antibody responses after a single immunization in mice. On the left side of the dotted line are mice that received protein and adjuvant vaccines. And these are dose matched. So they all got 0.9 micrograms of antigen. And on the right side of the dotted line are these mRNA launched nanoparticle, well, sorry, mRNA vaccines formulated in lipid nanoparticles, which include this mRNA launched nanoparticle vaccine. So a few things to point out. The blue circles here and the blue triangles here encode the exact same amino acid sequence, the same nanoparticle immunogen. It's just this one is delivered as an adjuvanted protein, and this one is delivered as an mRNA vaccine. And you can see that the mRNA vaccine is actually eliciting higher levels of antibodies than adjuvanted protein. The two more important comparisons, I think, are within the mRNA vaccine groups, where we saw that the mRNA-launched nanoparticle vaccine elicited tenfold higher levels of neutralizing activity than Pfizer BioNTech's membrane-anchored spike sequence. So apparently being an, uh, a nanoparticle immunogen matters even when you're delivered as an mRNA. And then the other important thing was that this group here is almost exactly the same protein, but it has a few mutations in it that don't allow it to assemble to this icosahedral nanoparticle. And you can see that th this one forms just a trimer, a secreted trimer. And you can see that the, the neutralizing activity elicited by this vaccine after one shot was very, very low. And so again, being a nanoparticle matters when delivered as mRNA. So when we look post-boost, so this is after a second shot of the vaccine in mice, we see that lots of the other immunogens in this experiment start to catch up. So the membrane anchored spike starts looking better, the secreted trimer starts looking better, but the mRNA launched nanoparticle vaccine remains the most potent of all. And so I wanna finish by just highlighting that everything we do right now is changing. Um, everything we do is being revolutionized by machine learning. So, you know, we've all heard of AlphaFold 2. Um, there are many other new machine learning techniques, particularly for protein design, that are being developed here at the IPD and, and David Baker's lab that are just totally changing the game and, and opening up new possibilities in both antigen and nanoparticle design. And I, I just want to show one example of this before we move to the discussion. Um, and that is that, you know, the, the promise of computational design of new nanoparticles is that we can really tailor the structure of these things to particular applications. Um, and there's a recent technique that, that was developed in the Baker Lab, a reinforcement learning technique um, called Monte Carlo Tree Search, um, that is, is really allowing us to do this now. So here, instead of going and finding pre-existing oligomeric building blocks and kind of docking them together and, and designing interfaces between them to make a new nanoparticle scaffold, you just make up a new nanoparticle completely from scratch. So you design the monomeric subunit of this nanoparticle and the nanoparticle itself at the same time. And you're literally just making this thing up on the back of a napkin, essentially, or in the computer. Um, and uh, Elias Kinfu and, and, and John, um, who I showed earlier, have been working to apply this, this protocol to develop antigen-tailored nanoparticle scaffolds. So this is an example of a scaffold that, that Elias designed um, that uses an oligomerization domain that we know works well with influenza neuraminidase tetramers, um, for which there's no known nanoparticle scaffold that enables multivalent display. And so here, Elias and John made up this new nanoparticle in a single step that's really, truly optimized to display uh, this type of tetrameric antigen. So this is just one example. There are many others of how machine learning is really revolutionizing what we're doing. So I'll stop there. Um, and just to kind of recapitulate what we talked about, um, computationally designed protein nanoparticles are now a clinically validated vaccine platform. So yes, you can make up new medicines on a computer. Um, 
I hope I've convinced you that systematic series of immunogens can help to define the structural and functional determinants of immunogenicity. And ideally someday we'll learn, you know, what the ideal, ideal vaccine looks like for each different um, pathogen. And then mRNA launched nanoparticle vaccines might be a potent, versatile, and rapidly manufacturable vaccine platform. There's a lot of additional work that needs to be done here to, to really show that's the case, but we think these early experiments are quite promising. And then I think the most important point of all is that we've only scratched the surface here. Um, these new machine learning based methods and, and continued methods development are really blowing this space wide open and, and we think are going to allow us to learn a lot more about how vaccines work and, and how to make better vaccines um, and will allow us to build better technology platforms that can actually go out into the world for, for public health impact. So I want to acknowledge the people that have done the work. So I tried to point out um, key players as I went along, but, but all of this has been a massive collaborative effort. Um, we collaborate quite widely. We love to work with other people. That's one of the most fun parts of science. Um, so beyond just our group, some of the work that I, shown, that I showed was from David Baker's group here at the IPD. Um, we work very closely with the Wieser Lab in biochemistry. Um, the data I showed today was from Young June and Lexi, but there's there's many other people in David's lab that are contributing to ongoing coronavirus vaccine efforts. Um, Lauren Carter runs the the core research labs here at the IPD, um, and the the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine was really a core labs effort um, from the people shown here. Uh, Laurent Perez, we work with on RSV and that that early antigen valency titration. Ralph Barrick and Tim Sheehan on on coronaviruses. Our collaborators at SK for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development, Acuitas is a company that helps formulate the, the mRNA vaccines for us. And then we work quite closely with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and, and our team over there um, really helped uh, push a lot of this work forward. So I'd love to, to have a discussion with you all and, and hear your thoughts and questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Neil, awesome talk. Um, <clears throat> There's one question from Wes, uh, which is, uh, where is IPD with universal flu vaccine coverage for bird flu in particular? This right, right. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't include any of the flu stuff today. Um, so um, we have been working on broadly protective influenza vaccines. We published a paper a couple years ago now showing that we can use these two component nanoparticles to co-display multiple different hemagglutinin antigens. So they're antigenically related. There are conserved epitopes that are present in all of the hemagglutinins. Um, and we found that that phenomenon uh, leads the immune system to focus responses on the conserved epitope, which in that case is the hemagglutinin stem. Um, and we showed that we elicit better stem responses from those mosaic nanoparticle immunogens. Um, that vaccine is in multiple phase one clinical trials right now at the NIH, and, and we think we're going to get data back from that one soon. We're continuing to work on influenza. Um, we don't think mosaic nanoparticle vaccines alone are going to be enough, and that's where a lot of the work on in, uh, neuraminidase has been coming in. So uh, traditional influenza vaccines may or may not contain neuraminidase, and it's unclear how antigenically intact those neuraminidases are. Um, we think that in many cases, they're, they're antigenically damaged by the manufacturing process. And so we've been doing a lot of the antigen design and then now as, as you saw a nanoparticle design to try to um, get better anti-neuraminidase antibody responses. And we think that's going to help provide broader protection as well. Yeah, um, I see okay. Robin's, yeah. Question. Robin's question. Yeah, sure. Um, so Robin's asking if there are plans to introduce um, the Korean tested vaccine to the U.S. market, or is there not enough uh, demand at this time? Other challenges that you guys have seen in the U.S.? Yeah, demand is the issue um, there, because now that the bivalent vaccines are out, nobody wants a monovalent vaccine anymore, right? And ours is based just on the ancestral Wuhan one strain. And so this, again, really highlights how manufacturing speed is so important, and particularly with COVID, where you know, the rate of, of variant generation and immune evasion has just been totally crazy. Um, so that, that vaccine, I think, will not come to the US. Um, we are working with SK and additional collaborators on a broadly protective sarbacovirus vaccine to try to protect against you know, many different SARS-like coronaviruses 
And the plan is for that program to advance to the clinic, maybe later this year, maybe early next year. I have one question, Neil. Yeah, um, uh, really exciting to see your um, work on the mRNA launch nanoparticle. Um, I guess that direction of your group. I guess taking it one step back, so, um, as a respiratory virus person, uh, what are your thoughts on like local delivery for nanoparticles um, for, especially in the respiratory tract for maybe eliciting a better response or protecting against mild disease, which is kind of at least where we are in the phase for the pandemic? Totally, yeah. So, so there's been a lot of work in that space over the last year or so. Akiko Iwasaki's group at Yale has really been championing um, intranasal boosts uh, to elicit mucosal immunity. And it seems like for getting tissue resident T cells, that works fairly well. It doesn't really seem to alter the antibody response that much. So in terms of providing sterilizing immunity, it's not clear to me that, you know, that is going to be the answer. Um, but I think, I think it's, it's a really intriguing technique there are some clear advantages in getting in terms of getting mucosal immunity. And so I'm excited to see uh, them push that forward into the clinic so that we can get a better read on how that works. But I do think more generally, I think it's a great question. Um, you know, in terms of information content of vaccines, local delivery provides totally different information than you know, intramuscular systemic delivery. So I think I think that's a research frontier that is really exciting to explore, and and we just need additional work in that area. One other follow up question, I guess, uh, for um, while we're waiting for others to ask more questions. For uh, I guess you implied this, but uh, with the mRNA uh, launched nanoparticles, uh, I guess the assumption is that hopefully. Uh, that time period between um, for the development of the vaccine or, I mean, I know approval is maybe another question, but is, is that what you're really getting at and hoping to accomplish with um, doing yeah. that versus starting from the, from the nanoparticle? Trajectory? Exactly. Yeah. I think, I, and I think there are a few different ways that can be important. I mean, one is for clinical development, obviously, but even preclinically, if RNA could allow us to iterate more rapidly, right, and test many more designs in vivo more rapidly, then we should learn faster what the ideal features of a vaccine are. Um, so I think that's a particularly exciting prospect. I'm not sure that that's actually been put into practice yet, or maybe it has, and the publications just aren't quite out, um, but I think that would be super fun. I see a hand raised from, I think, an iPhone. Um, Isabel. Uh, okay. I have a question that actually did not understand in your talk. You um, explained that you used uh, you include mRNA that I, I can see that you can design proteins um, and, and uh, injecting mRNA, but I didn't understand the glycosylation part. How do you hmm. encode glycosylation in the mRNA? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so great question. Um, so. Just putting an in-linked glycan, engineering an in-linked glycan into a protein sequence is quite easy um, because the, the glycosylation machinery recognizes a sequon, asparagine, any amino acid other than proline, and then either a serine or threonine at position three. So if you just put that NXST motif into a protein that is secreted through the eukaryotic secretory pathway, you will get an in-linked glycan at that position. So that's quite easy, um, but as I showed the effect, the trafficking effect that we see is specifically due to high mannose glycans. And that depends on glycan, glycan processing in the ER and the Golgi during secretion. And so the question there is, how do you control glycan processing during secretion? And can you control that? Can you encode that in an amino acid sequence? And, I, and the answer is yes, there are naturally occurring proteins that are existence proofs that this can be done, but nobody's done it controllably through design yet. And we're booting up a project right now to try to do that. And so the goal is to be able to genetically encode not just in-linked glycans, but specifically high mannose glycans. Any other questions? Oh, 
Okay, um, from Evan, um, have you published on the launched mRNA work? Have you done any imaging work um, there on immune responses? We have not published that work yet. We're, we're working on it. Um, we need to do a few additional things. We need to characterize the T-cell response. So Bali Palindrons group is doing a T-cell study right now. Um, and we're doing a couple other things, a dose titration study, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we'll be putting that, together that paper soon. And then in terms of imaging, we have not done anything yet, but we're just starting those efforts and we're really excited to see how that goes. Yeah. We'll keep you posted. All right, uh, Jan is asking, any information on your vaccines in children or young animals? Yeah, great, great question. Um, not yet. So SK Bioscience is age de-escalating. They have additional clinical trials ongoing with the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine where they are age de-escalating. So we will get data, um, but none of that is available yet. Um, and then in terms, I don't, we haven't done anything like um, infant NHPs or anything like that. So young animals, we don't know. And then Marcella's question, cost effectiveness of making these. Yeah, so that is one of our hopes is that is that nanoparticle vaccines will be more cost effective because you might be able to dose spare due to their increased potency. Um, and then you can imagine, you know, the, the current SARS-CoV-2 vaccine was manufactured in one, one of the proteins was manufactured in CHO cells and the other in E. coli. Um, CHO cell manufacturing can be a little bit more expensive. It's still, you know, because the doses for vaccines are so small, it's still reasonably cost effective, but you can imagine ways of making that cheaper by using other eukaryotic expression hosts, things like yeast or insect cells. Um, and then hopefully I think there's going to be, you know, just a massive amount of effort into bringing the cost of mRNA manufacturing down. And so hopefully that will come down to, to allow wider access. But the, the whole SARS-CoV-2 and now broadly protective vaccine work that we've done with SK was all geared at um, uh, low and middle income countries. So all that work was funded by CEPI to try to get the vaccine out to LMICs. Are there other, sorry, just to follow up, are there other um, transport or storage considerations that um, might be more favorable for? Yeah, we think so. So as you know, currently the mRNA vaccines require freezing for distribution, um, although people are working on that as well. Uh, our nanoparticle vaccine is shipped at four degrees, um, so does not require freezing, which is certainly an advantage. Um, we would love to get to the point where, you know, you don't even require refrigeration. Um, and that really depends on the antigen. The nanoparticles that we design tend to be quite stable, um, often times they, they don't disassemble or unfold even when boiled at 100 degrees Celsius. So um, the nanoparticle stability doesn't appear to be an issue, but the antigen often unfolds um, at higher temperatures. So I think additional antigen design will be needed there. And then Robin, the universal, yeah. What portion of the virus is it targeting and how do nanoparticle vaccines perform compared to traditional? Um, yeah, so this is this is where where the antigen design work comes in. So, based on the responses that we've seen from the the SARS-CoV-2 RBD nanoparticle vaccine, we're actually focusing on the RBD for our broadly protective sarbacovirus program. There are broadly conserved epitopes in the RBD um, that are targeted by antibodies and 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 neutralize the virus. Um, so we've been exploring that antigen format. And this is something where, and I, I tried to make this point early on, but I never quite came back to it. When you ask how do they perform compared to traditional vaccines for these, you know, subdominant regions, this is where, you know, both antigen and nanoparticle design combined can make a huge difference, right? And allow you to target subdominant epitopes by altering the structure of these things. And, and that's what we did in influenza with the mosaic nanoparticle vaccines, and, and we're trying to do that here in coronavirus as well. But as you know, anyone who has worked in the space knows these, these types of universal vaccines are very difficult. I don't think we're there yet. It's not a solved problem, but it's one where addition, additional technology development, I think will be very helpful. Great. 
not seeing any other questions. Oh, one last one. Here we go. <laughs> um, can time of design development of nanoparticle vaccines be reduced yeah. like mRNA timelines? I yeah, think. I think, um, I mean, that's what we're trying to do by launching these things from mRNA. Um, so on the manufacturing side, we should be similar. Um, of course, we might, re might require additional time for design up front. I will say that the RBD nanoparticle that we made the particular particle that we used predated the pandemic. So that particle was just there. And we were able to put those sequences together just as fast as Moderna put theirs together. So that did not require any additional time for design. However, as we're moving more towards like bespoke or customized nanoparticle immunogens, there will be design time required. And so we're working hard on our computational methods development to try to bring that time down. Well, this has yeah, been fun. This thank, has been a great discussion. Yeah, thank you so much. This was really fascinating. And yeah, looking forward to seeing some of the um, work you shared being published as well. So congratulations. Um, great. And just a reminder, uh, next session will be on March 21st. So we'll see you then. Thanks.